right, so I think that anybody in this audience can appreciate that if you want to tackle climate change, you need ways to store energy. And that's whether you want to power your car or if you want to store energy from a solar panel and use it for later. <coughs> and by energy storage, mostly we mean batteries, but other ideas are important, such as thermal energy storage. All right, so where do PDEs come into this? Well, let me put it to you guys this way. If anybody in this audience could come up with a way to make batteries, say, 25% cheaper, I could tell you that that would go a long way to solve climate change right then and there. <clears throat> but if that's your goal, if your goal is we want to make batteries cheaper or whatever, you're going to need a deep understanding of the transport of multiple species and a way to model the complex chemical reactions that occur within a battery. That's where PDEs come in. Those equations on the right, those are the Onsaga Stefan Maxwell equations. Those are partial differential equations that describe the multi-component molecular diffusion of different species in a complex fluid such as an electrolyte that you would find in a battery. <coughs> All right, stay with me. So, <coughs> it's not exactly a newsflash that you can use PDEs to solve problems in engineering and whatever, and specifically batteries. But what this thesis does is it places these PDEs on firmer footing. We prove existence and uniqueness results. We construct a novel variational formulation. We even make up an entirely new function space just to solve this problem, a function space that is inspired by the thermodynamic structure of the problem. Perhaps what's most crucial, though, is our analysis leads us to a numerical method, a finite element method, a way to practically solve these PDEs <coughs> in a very general setting. Now, with this, this numerical method, we can prove error estimates and stability results for, and we've already implemented it for a bunch of different um, prototypes, and we're on our way right now to scale it up to model energy storage system in a way that hasn't been done before. <coughs> all right, so sort of to, to wrap this up, I just want you guys to do me a favor. Like, look at the roof. Just, like, look at all the steel beams and concrete or whatever is in here, right? Do you think this building was built without solving a PDE? Well, let's go more full out. Look at that bridge. That's the biggest bridge in the world. That's near Shanghai. How many simulations do you think they did before they built that bridge? <coughs> and in fact, <coughs> these simulations, though, they rely on a deep understanding of the PDEs behind them. <coughs> and our ability to do these simulations has mean, meant that we can build things like bridges cheaper, faster, better, safer. It's transformed our ability to do structural engineering. And that kind of transformation is what we need to do to energy storage because the stakes are much higher. And that's part of the aim of this thesis. Thank you. Kidney stones affect about 10% of the UK population in their lifetime, which is quite a big chunk of the people here. And one of the main um, treatments for, this, um, for kidney stones is ureteroscopy. And you see here, this um, involves inserting a ureteroscope through the bladder and into the kidney. Um, on the left, we see a cross-section of the ureteroscope, and this contains an optical fibre. And on the right, you see that the fibre is placed really close to the stones. This is about a millimetre away. And laser pulses are fired at the kidney stone, breaking it into smaller pieces that can easily be retrieved from the kidney. As a byproduct of this, um, the fluid in the kidney also absorbs a laser energy. So the liquid vaporizes, causing a bubble, as we see here. The laser can be pulsed in different ways. So these are some examples of different pulse patterns. And the pulse patterns affect the way that the stone breaks and also affect the bubble dynamics. But this is a treatment for kidney stones, so why do we care about the bubbles? Well, the bottom is an example of the Moses effect, and this is one of the cool ways that the bubble and the stone interact. Um, so these images don't rel relate to the graphs above, <laughs> but this is a process going left to right. So the initial part of the pulse, a lot of it is lost to the fluid, to the liquid. It vaporizes, the vapor expands, fills the gap, and now the fluid can pass freely um, through the vapor to the stone. So just like Moses parted the sea, the vapor is parting the way for the laser energy to travel. So I'm working with collaborators who um, manufacture these lasers, and they would like to be able to use the pulse pattern to control exactly how the bubble, um, bubble dynamics are, to control exactly how much energy reaches the stone. So my project is uh, modeling bubble dynamics as a function of pulse pattern. 
Um, this is tricky. It involves um, a, a coupling heat transfer, fluid dynamics, and a moving boundary. We're exploring two approaches. So first you see where we have two distinct regions, vapour and um, liquid. And the second approach is one set of averaged equations with a phase fraction, um, which tells us here how much um, vapour there is at any point. Um, so this is a topic that's been researched experimentally a lot in the past, but it's not been modelled um, mathematically. So now we're studying these models um, using analytic numerical methods and validating with experimental data so we can give our collaborators a much deeper understanding of the underlying physics so that they can develop better lasers. Um, so they want to be able to take advantage of effects such as the Moses effect to make the procedure um, quicker, easier and safer. So uh, the story of my research actually begins in 1900 um, at the, uh, the International Congress of Mathematicians when David Hilbert presented his famous list of 23 problems that he regarded to be the most important problems in mathematics for the next century to come. In particular, I'm concerned with the 10th problem, um, which is find an algorithm that decides for any given Diophantine equation um, with integer coefficients if it has a solution in the integers or not. So um, what is the Diophantine equation? These are just polynomial equations, so you're allowed to add and multiply numbers where the coefficients are integers and you only care about solutions in the integers. For example, x to the 3 plus 8 is equal to 0 does have an integer solution, namely x is equal to minus 2. But the equation x squared plus 2 is equal to 0 doesn't have a solution because the squares of integers are non-negative. Um, another famous Diophantine equation is um, the Fermat equation, x plus 1 to the n plus y plus 1 to the n is equal to z plus 1 to the n, where x, y, and z are natural numbers. Now, Fermat conjectured that uh, there are no solutions um, if n is greater than or equal to 3. Well, given the fact that this very building is named after the mathematician who solved this problem, you can probably appreciate this is a very hard problem. And in fact, one can also encode um, the Riemann hypothesis and the four color theorem as Diophantine equations. So David Hilbert's algorithm would be able to solve all of these questions at the same time. Now you might be saying, well, that sounds a bit too good to be true. And you'd be right, because in 1900, uh, 1970, Yuri Metesevich proved that there is no such algorithm that can solve any, uh, can decide any given Diophantine equation over the integers. So case closed, right? Um, well, not quite, because often in algebraic number theory, uh, one also cares about rational solutions. So um, why did Hilbert not ask the problem of the rationals then? Well, the reason is that um, once you have found, David Hilbert really believed such an algorithm exists. And once you have found an algorithm that works over the integers, you can tweak it a little bit to also work over the rational numbers. But now there is no algorithm over the integers. So there's nothing to tweak, and the problem of the rational numbers is still open. And in fact, in his original thesis, Matthias Evich wrote that probably to solve the problem of the rational numbers, one would need an entirely different approach. And this is where my research comes in. I'm trying to make use of tools that were not available at the time from model theory, general valuation theory, infinite Galois theory, um, to apply um, to this particular problem um, from a new modern point of view. Yeah. Over the next three minutes, I'm going to try and uh, introduce you to biological membranes, explain uh, why they're interesting and why their curvature particularly is interesting and then hopefully um, try and tell you a bit about what I'm doing to try and understand a bit more about this. So biological membranes, uh, I've kind of tried to draw an example in the middle here. They're made up of this fluid bi uh, lipid bilayer that and all these membranes surround cells. So they separate what's inside the cell and what's outside of the cell. So what's blue and what's white. But they're also really dynamic environments. So they have lots of proteins inside them. For example, this membrane transporter protein on the right, this green with an arrow, and that controls what can cross the membrane. They also have enzymes in this red, so that can catalyze a reaction. And um, they also have on the, the far left over there, these uh, black proteins that have bar domains. And what these bar domains do is they can stick to the membrane and induce a curvature. So obviously the, the membrane has some kind of stiffness. So the more we curve the membrane, it, it's an energetic cost. The more we curve it, the more energy is required. So when we have two uh, membranes, membrane bound curvature inducing proteins, 
they can start to interact via the membrane. So for example, on the right, if the two bumps were to move closer or further away, they could change the energy that was stored in this deformation. And so you can start to generate forces that try to move these inclusions closer together or further apart. But when we start to get lots of these things interacting together, we can start to get large deformations. So on the bottom left here, I've shown a process where a cell takes something in from outside in the wider environment and brings it in. And you can see that at parts of this process, there's really a large deformation in the, in the cell membrane. And these large deformations have been shown to kind of correlate with these bar proteins that come and bind and cause this curvature. And so what we're trying to understand is how can these many body collective dynamics start to induce these shape changes? And there's lots of other processes as well. So you can think of a cell dividing that starts to split and there's a large shape change. And that's because the geometry of the membrane really does dictate how information is transferred across the membrane and how, um, how the cell grows, how growth in a, a, a whole organism is, is is uh, understood. And so in addition to understanding these collective uh, dynamics, what we're trying to understand is how we can, uh, we're trying to understand the role of asymmetry in these proteins. So on the bottom right here, you can see this bowl shape, and that's how people tend to study uh, membrane-bound proteins, as having this constant curvature in every direction. And our innovation is to try and introduce this Pringle-type mode, where you have asymmetries, so it's not necessarily the same deformation in all directions. And so we're trying to understand how this asymmetry and these collective body dynamics can influence the shape of membranes and, and cells. Thank you very much. My default research has been studying droplet impact onto deformable substrates. So by deformable substrate, I mean the droplet will hit onto the substrate and that substrate will then move and uh, deform in response to it. And then the droplet then spreading and it's affected by that. So the picture on the top there is a motivational example. So we have droplet impact onto some sort of leaf. The leaf wobbles in response to the droplet. So uh, mathematically, we model our problem using the big set of equations, which I've purposely put small in the middle there. And essentially what we have is the Navier-Stokes equations to model the fluid. So we consider two different modeling techniques to study this problem. The first is an asymptotic solution. So basically what we do is we make a lot of approximations such as chucking out viscosity and all these things which come in at low order compared to the inertia. And then we can get a sort of pen and paper handwritten solution for um, early times. So that's really good. We have like a satisfactory solution, but it's relying on a lot of assumptions which in themselves we can't validate. So on the other hand, we do direct numerical simulations. What they do is just brute force solve all the equations without any of these assumptions. And that allows us to validate what's going on with the asymptotics. But the downside to these is that they're very computationally expensive. So they can take between a few hours to a few days to solve per equation. So with both of these models, we sort of need them both because a DNS can validate the asymptotics, but then the asymptotics are limited in their scope. So um, yeah, so when we have both of these, we can then use them together to study the sort of full range of the problem. So what we found in our results is that when a droplet impacts onto a substrate, typically what happens is that the droplet hits and then loses energy via deforming this substrate. As it loses energy, it slows down as it starts to spread across the substrate. So less fluid ends up spreading across and it's spreading slower. What that means is that if a droplet spreads slower, it's less likely to break up and splash. And the reason we care about this is that there's many examples in industry and nature where understanding what splashing does is really important. So in the top example, these are experiments where they're trying to model pesticide dispersion. So this is where droplets impact onto leaves and you want them to splash and spread pesticides as much as possible. However, there are other scenarios where we want the opposite. So we have, for example, inkjet printing, where you have drops of ink hitting onto pieces of paper. And in that scenario, you don't want them to splash because you'll get messy ink all over your paper. So through being Doing both models, we can sort of have a combined approach which will give us um, a universal solution that will allow us to study all different ranges of parameters and timescales for our problem. So, thanks so much for listening. So, thank you for coming. Uh, in my thesis, I want to focus on one key definition. We say a set of integers is primitive if no member in the set divides any of the others. For example, the set of primes is a primitive set because no prime divides another. And more generally, for any integer k, the set of numbers with exactly k prime factors forms a primitive set. 
So this definition is very simple, and hence emits a very broad class of sets. Uh, historically, uh, people have been interested in so-called perfect numbers. So since ancient Greece, we say a number is perfect if it equals the sum of its proper divisors. For example, 6 has proper divisors 1, 2, and 3, which add together to give 6 again. So we number theorists often think of the primes as these very special, beautiful objects, uh, like a diamond. And I'd encourage you to think of, more generally, the broader class of primitive sets as uh, a treasure trove of these precious jewels, including emeralds, rubies, sapphires, and so on. And just like precious gems, each have special uh, properties, for example, their brilliance, their color, value, rarity. We want to think of uh, each of these primitive sets having special properties. For example, the primes, uh, by the prime number theorem, we know that the primes become more and more rare the further out we go along the number line. And technically speaking, we'd say that the primes have density zero. In 1935, the great mathematician Paul Erdős generalized this result considerably. He proved that any primitive set has lower density zero. And in the course of his proof, he came up with a formula, f of a for every primitive set a, which detects the size of these rare sets, even if they have density zero. And in 1988, he famously conjectured that his formula, f of a, is bounded by f of the primes for any primitive set a. So in other words, the Erdős primitive set conjecture asserts that the primes are maximal among all primitive sets. And when I first heard about this conjecture, I absolutely fell in love with the problem because it really gives us some concrete sense uh, in which the primes are special in a broader context. And in general in life, it's not often easy to kind of uh, describe uh, articulately why we love the things we do. Um, so I've been working on this problem for many years and tried several approaches. Uh, but recently, uh, in the winter, during lockdown, I found that there was a beautiful connection with this problem to probability theory and actually enabled uh, uh, the solution to this problem. So I can now say uh, with great pleasure that the Erdős primitive set conjecture is true. Thank you.